Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, where a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. So, Melanie, we had two days of 90-plus degree temperatures here in the Boston area, or as I like to call it, early spring in Texas. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was a couple hot days. It's like a hot day and a half, frankly. Saturday morning wasn't all that hot. But, uh, yeah. So let's talk, get right into it. Uh, before we get to what we've been doing this week, we had a little bit of listener feedback on uh, something you talked about last week on your uh, book books that you're reading. Oh, fun. Son of Hensar wrote on our Discord, which in case you don't remember, uh, we have a new StarQuest Discord community, which you can join at sqpn.com slash Discord, D-I-S-C-O-R-D. And uh, it's like a it's like a chat room or a, a bulletin board. And a lot of folks have joined it to chat with uh, all of us from StarQuest. So it's really nice. And despite the name, Discord does not mean there's lots of fighting. Yes, it's, a, it's ironic. Anyway, Son of Hanser from Discord in the Raising the Bets channel said uh, in response to your uh, recommendation of the book, or at least that you're reading the book, Brisbane. Right. Uh, he said, uh, I'll, or he or she, I think, it, well, it says Son of Hanser, so I'm going to say he. I'll have to try Brisbane. I enjoyed reading The Aviator by the same author, Vodolaskin. Also, for an idea of where Russia might be heading back to, The Big Green Tent by Ludmila Ulitskaya is a good read, following a group of friends through post-Stalin to the 80s. That sounds like fun. Yeah, I had noticed The Aviator and one other book. Um, by Vola, by Vola, Vola Vodolaskin. Uh, on Amazon, and I was thinking I'm probably going to work my way through all of his books that are available in English. Um, yeah, so you recently had a sort of like an Africa phase. You were reading lots of African novels, yes, so novels by African authors. Because Isabella's been doing Africa for Africa geography. In school. Yep. And so now you're, you're kind of in a Russian, Ukrainian, Slavic phase. Yeah, we can say that. Cool. Fun. Um, I, yeah, I find that sometimes I do tend to kind of read one author for a while and, or one geographical area. Yeah, and um, <laughs> it's sorry. very important not to yawn into the microphone <laughs> while we're podcasting. <laughs> Are you gonna... It's been a long day. Yeah, I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was going to say, I, I did start reading Things Fall Apart and I found myself not as engaged. I really do want to finish it at some point, but I think I'm going to have to come back to it. Okay. I, I, I've read like... 30% of it my way into the book. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think I'm much more interested right now in Russian, Russian, Rus books. Russian novels, modern Russian novels. So if you, anyone else has book recommendations, want to talk about any of the books that we've been talking about or any of the things we've been talking about, please go join the, uh, the, the discord community and uh, find the raising the bets chat room and jump in there. We'd love to talk with you about, about books and stuff as well as anything else. Awesome. All right. So this is what we've been doing this week. It's been a full week. Yes, it has. I'm, I think I've mentioned before that we have solar panels and that we had a problem with the installation of the solar panels that got discovered last fall when we had our, our flooding issue uh, in the house where uh, we had pipes break and we had flooding and had to tear everything out. And in the process of that discovered that the solar panels had been installed improperly. And so the roof had been leaking as well. How did we figure that out? Uh, Joe, the contractor, found it when he was tearing the walls out, away, the, the walls that were moldy far away from where the flooding was. They were like, the, it's not, they couldn't have been flooding from the bottom up. They had and to be flooding was, from the top down. And he was tearing them out. Because it was a visible mold on the wall. Right, on the outside we, of the wall. Right, when we pulled all the furniture away, we saw the mold there. So he tore it out and found the inside and was tracing where it was coming from and traced it up to the attic where he saw all the mold on the rafters and the, and on the, the, the wood of the, the decking, you joists. know, the, the, well, the, those are rafters and joists, but also the decking, the, the roof itself, 
the inside. So the solar panel company came out and they patched the holes, but they've, they're going to repair the roof. In fact, they've, they've, we've had, dealt with their insurance company in the settlement and uh, they've paid us a bunch of money so that we can get a whole new roof. And uh, so they're going to come and take the panels off. We'll have our roofer come in our, our contractor who has been doing all this work. He's loving us. They've been getting a lot of work from us. They're going to re- take all the, the shingles off, redo the roof, put new, even new rafters in. Some of the rafters are really bad anyway. So been dealing with that, trying to, arrange all that. So that's one thing. Then we found out when we had uh, the oil guy, so we have oil heat, which means an oil tank and our insurance rider has a um, oil spill rider on it. In case the oil spills, the insurance company will pay for the cleanup, which is a huge deal because uh, oil cleanup is a, is a very expensive tens of thousands of dollars if it gets into the dirt. Anyway, uh, that required an inspection. So the oil technician came out and he said, "Uh, do you know your tank is leaking? So all, our tank is above ground. All tanks, tanks used to be buried. They used to be buried in your yard uh, until about, I'd say, 35 years ago. They passed a law that the tanks now had to be above ground on a concrete. Probably to prevent leaks from causing in, in huge <laughs> leaking into the dirt. <laughs> environmental hazards. Yes. So now they're above ground. Uh, so ours is right outside this, my office here. And it was under a, sh- a shed that was kind of attached to the house. Not kind of, it was attached to the house. And it was leaking, so he patched it, but it had to be replaced. The, the tank was about 20 years old, and the guy said tanks have a, a life of 20 to 30 years. It had to be done right away, like right away. So I had to rush to arrange that. So we got that done. That's $3,500 later. That was done on Friday. But we also had to tear, have the shed torn down because they, they couldn't move. The shed was built around the tank. There was no way to get the tank out of the shed. The shed had to be torn down. So the shed will now have to be rebuilt. <laughs> more so, work for the contractor. More work for the contractor. He's like, yes, fine. I'll do that too. So that was done. So at least that's done. You know, the, the, the shed needs to be built, but the tank is new. And they said this tank should last forever, basically, pro- probably longer than we'll own this house. So one less thing to worry about. Uh, I killed my mower, my lawnmower. I think I mentioned that last week uh, that it was did. broken. Turns out it's dead. I I I really whacked that rock with with that with the blade. Uh, and my friend, the auto mechanic, he t- told me to bring it by. He took one look at it and said, "Oh no, that's dead. You need a new mower." So I went and got a new mower, which should be here Tuesday. I had it delivered because I don't have anything to carry it home in. It won't fit in the van. I'd have to take it out of all the boxes and stuff. Pain in the neck. So that's been my week. <laughs> Busy. There's even more. I don't want to belabor the whole podcast with all of the the, the stuff. There's like a whole nother whole thing. Maybe we'll talk about some other time. But for the, for the nonce, that's a, that's quite enough. Uh, just one thing after another. By the time we're done, we're going to. It's going to be the house of Theseus. <laughs> like, is it our house if we've replaced everything? <laughs> By that point, it is. Is it the same house? We we we'll, we shall see. Also, this week was Isabella's birthday. Yes. Yes. Isabella turned sixteen. How was that, Melanie? Um, a little <laughs> emotional? Yeah. How is my baby 16? Uh, honestly, I felt like it's really kind of hard to buy for 16-year-olds. Like, Yes. Just I, Well, I say some 16-year-olds would probably be easy. 16-year-old girls. Let's be clear here. But some 16-year-olds, they're clear what they want. They want... A girl, maybe clothes or uh, music or, well, they don't do music anymore. It all comes with uh, Apple music. Say, yeah, B- Bella loves music, but it's it's all Apple Play, so we can't buy her music. Apple, Apple, Apple Potify or whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, that's true. Um, phone or stuff like that. I, I, I'm, I'm, she, she has all the tech she needs. Yeah, I'm struggling to think of what things six year old, normal 16-year-old girls want. So what did we get her? Um... We got her a couple T-shirts. Yeah. Uh, we got her, including Star Wars T-shirts, because yes, always. Yeah. Um, I got a really nice uh silk scarf. It was made from recycled saris, came from India. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was something really kind of pretty and girly. Yeah. Uh, and then a Star Wars black series action figure of from the bad of uh 
Tech from the Bad tech Batch. Tech from the Bad Batch. Oh, struggling to get that out. Yes. Yes. There's way too many words there. <laughs> uh, she, ha- she and Sophia have quite an extensive collection of Star Wars Black Series action figures, and they st- they really like them. They pose them in stories and make take pictures of tableaus. Yeah. Yeah, of the figures. Um, so it's kind of photography. I mean, it, it's more sophisticated than little kids playing with them. They are like doing sophisticated photography and lighting and... and Trying to do depth of field stuff with them. Yeah. yeah. So, so much more advanced than just... Yeah. But they're still playing games. with them. They're at that stage, that cusp of adulthood... Well, there are adults who play with action figures. <laughs> they, I guess there are. <laughs> so... The, yes. The, so we got her that. And uh, she also has a new computer, which wasn't really a birthday present, but really a replacement for her dying Chromebook. And I had a spare Mac sitting around. So we ended up setting that up for. The, for. But, but that kind of came around the same time as her birthday. So sort of. So sort of happy that. birthday. Uh, also, then my mom got her a couple of necklaces, um, a really nice one from my my friend Kira. Um Whose company Iron Lace Designs does? She does a uh, chain mail, chain mail jewelry, which jewelry. which is much more feminine than that sounds. Yeah, this this piece was really cool. Kira's dad was a, a watchmaker, and so she has lots of little watch parts sitting around in her house, and she's made his workroom into to her workroom, and uh, so this has like cool movable watch parts and it kind of steampunky. Yeah. Yep. And the, and the necklace by chain mail, it just means like it's made of interlocking rings. Uh, and so it, it's 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 much more. I'll put a link to her website. Check it out because she also makes rosaries in this yeah. style, which we've mentioned before. And they're the awesomest rosaries. Very sturdy. Very like super sturdy. But, very, and, very worth worth the, the, the price. Definitely. And yeah. Um, and then my and then my mom also gave her a really sweet sentimental uh, necklace, which was the necklace that my mom gave to her maid of honor at her wedding as a, you know, the, the thank you, gift. the thank you gift for the maid of honor. And recently her maid of honor contacted oh, 50 her 50 years ago, right. Or something. Right. Uh, yeah. My parents celebrated their 50th anniversary in 2017. Right. So 55 years ago. Um, so her maid of honor contacted her and said, I have cherished this for a long time, but I don't really have anyone to pass it on to, to whom it would mean as much. So would you like to pass this on to one of your granddaughters? And so my mom gave it to Isabella. It's a beautiful little cameo necklace. Mm. Um, and there's a, there's a, I mean, it's such a sweet, sentimental story. I think I that think is that nice. A lot. Yeah. Um, so, so thank, thanks to my mom's maid of honor, Marianne, for, mm. for passing that back into the family again. So for birthday dinner, we went to our local Mexican place, which is the only good Mexican place near us because we don't live in Texas. Um, Sombrero in Weymouth, if you're in the area, that's that's really good. Uh, Very nice Guatemalan family uh, owns it. Guatemalan? Uh, Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're Guatemalan. Okay. I I could be mistaken, but I I think I remember seeing somewhere that they're Guatemalan. Maybe I might be wrong, but it's a really good restaurant and really nice people. Excellent service. Uh, I had another Michelada because, you know, I like Micheladas. We had a whole episode right, which was titled Making Micheladas. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had a margarita. I, I usually don't have cocktails, but it felt celebratory. So I had one yeah. and it was good. Yeah, really good. So that was uh, Bella's birthday. Then uh, on Saturday, we had a first farmer's market of the season that we were able to make it to. We didn't get to go to the first one because that was we had a scout hike last week, but we were able to go to this one. We got there a little late. Yeah. Which meant that there was hardly a, that place was picked over. The, yeah. The, the the bakery had no more bread. The um, the, the some of the, the uh, farmers had very little in the way of produce left. I mean, generally, the first few markets in May, there's not a lot in New England yet. There's like greens. There's the early greens. Yeah. There's, there's greens and radishes. And that's about that's about it. <laughs> oh, got some radishes. I'll talk about those in a second. But. Yeah, I love I love the fresh radishes. Um, yeah, and then we got some eggs and we got some uh, jam. But even even like the Tom the fish guy, he was out of everything. Like he had mussels and that was it. He, he had no nothing else left. Uh, so, but it was nice to see everyone and catch up because we missed most of the fall market last year because uh, right. we were at home. And the, and the few ones we did go to, 
they were so busy. It wasn't really, we weren't able to really talk to our favorite vendors. Yeah. The, the early spring markets are the ones where you can really catch up with folks. And, and we heard from several people who exclaimed at how tall the children had all gotten. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, yep, keep feeding them. They keep doing that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've been going to this market since the well, Isabella uh, and Sophie were a little. For 14 years. Yeah. Like Bella was two. Sophie was one. Yeah. Ben was a baby. Yeah. I and mean, we had just moved to, 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 uh, in 2008. Did, well, we probably didn't go till the spring of 2009. Yeah. So 13 years, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it's been a long time. It is, it's changed, you know, but some people have, are still there from the beginning. Was Summer's Bounty there from the beginning? The, the jam ladies? No, they didn't come for a few. So we'd been going for a few years. So apart from that, the, the old lady, uh, who runs the farm, the little farm stand, who has been there all along? I'm trying to think of, I can't think of anyone who's been there from the beginning. No, I think we're, we're actually have outlasted all the vendors. Yeah. So as far as they know, all the vendors who are there. We've we, always been there. We've always been at the farmer's market. Yeah. The, uh, the cookie, the wedding cookie guy. Remember him? Yeah. Yeah. He was always, he always gives the free Italian wedding cookies. Yeah. Those. Yeah. Early days. Anyway, nostalgia. Then, uh, so that was Saturday. Then afterward we went to. Our favorite seafood, local seafood place, because grandma was in town and grandma wanted to go. Well, the only time we ever go with that to, to Jake's, which is uh, in Nantasket uh, Beach in, uh, in in Hull, Mass. Um, the only time we, we go there really is when either grandma has come to town or granddad has come to town. Yeah. And so grandma was there and she took us all to Jake's and uh, just it's always good. It's kind of we were just kind of commenting today how it's the menu was a a little bit stuck in the past it's like yeah the like the uh you were saying something about the the, the flavorings the, the fish is pretty much they have one seasoning it's cajun seasoning so you can either have it with no seasoning or with cajun seasoning <laughs> right right you can get cajun light or cajun blackened <laughs> but, but so you have three choices uh but nevertheless it's really good and it's it's kind it's it's kind of midway between regular family fair and fancy yeah it, it's it got it's kind of it's a little bit on the higher price side but it's um it's comfortable it's casual but it's it's good it's i mean the kids all love it too so that's that's good to know to to, to know anyway so that was jake's then today with the heat we went to mass this morning and oh it was our as we've said before our church is not air conditioned so in new england not a lot of catholic churches are but when it's hitting going toward 90 it, it was it wasn't bad that the, the church is a gothic stone like english gothic yes so it's it's got a very high ceiling and that helps to keep things cooler right especially early in the season when it hasn't gotten you know soaked in all the heat of the summer right but it was still heading toward 90 it was in the upper 80s at that point so it was still uncomfortable those the poor the boys were like melting they were trying to fan themselves with bulletins and stuff yeah. But uh, so that was. I was wondering if I should invest in small fans. Small hand fans, not like electric fans. Not electric. No, no. But but the, just like hand fans, like. But, you know, kind of prettier like ones. Old, rather like than, old ladies in the South. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I was a little, I actually had some of the, some little old ladies in the South, some fans uh, from my great aunts that had, you know, when my great aunt passed away, I got some of her things. I got her gloves. Because, mm -hmm. of course, she was a lady of the era where you were wore lady wore gloves. Yeah. And um, some of some of her fans. And I would love to have one of those fans so that when father said something controversial in the homily, I could go, oh, my. And do it when fan myself. Um, <laughs> Mercy. Or, Woo. Bless me. Not. <laughs> okay. Mental note. You don't get a fan. Aww. Everybody else gets a fan. You I don't trust the fan. <laughs> oh, my father. <laughs> <laughs> in any case so yeah so we had mass it was hot uh the kids made it all through uh, i filled up the van the gas tank it would have been a hundred dollars if i hadn't gotten the grocery store discount off the gas uh-huh oh just oh <laughs> every i know you all know because you you were all doing the, going through the same thing we are and yeah, maybe yeah, worse the the uh Lots of trips this summer just doesn't feel like it's going to be happening. No, no. Uh, I mean, after 
after several years of COVID, I would be thinking, okay, finally we can get out and we can go and do things. And now it's just like, but it's too expensive yes, to go to things. go anywhere. So we're just going to have another staycation yeah. summer. We've got two things planned. That's going to take us far. We've got, we're going camping on the it's Cape. It's not that far. Yeah. We're going camping on Cape Cod and then it's summer camp on Cape Cod. So those are probably the only two long journeys that the van is going to go on this summer because we can't afford it otherwise. Ugh. And Cape Cod's not that far. And Cape Cod's not that far, but yeah, we're not going any further than that. Um, all right. So that was this morning. And then for your mom said, look, while I'm still here, I want you to shoot to go out for dinner. Just the two of you. We never, we never have dates. We don't go out on dates except again, when your mom and your dad are here and they watch the kids. For, for us while we go out. Uh, so we got to go out and we decided to go to this place. Uh, Hingham is the, is a nearby town. It's on the ocean. So we went to the Hingham shipyard and we went to a tapas bar, right? I mean, but sort of, I mean, they it wasn't really build, tapas. They didn't build themselves as tapas, but they were in Yelp under the, under the category of tapas. Yeah. Because they, I mean, it was, they had lots of small plates uh, it was like a, it was, what did they call themselves? Something in raw bar. Trident galley and raw bar. Galley and raw bar. So yeah. it's sort of a seafood themed. Um, the, the, the big yeah. focus was the, the raw bar, the oysters. Yeah. I'm trying to find the uh, menu so we could uh, look at the, uh, what the things we got. I don't know if, the, if they'll have the menu on the so site. We, we got, um, got half a dozen oysters. Yeah, yummy oysters. Yummy oysters. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't there during the the oyster happy hour because they have a on let's see weekdays from four to six, and then every day from nine to closing, they do dollar oysters. Which we should have gone on a weekday. No, I'm kidding. I'm I'm tempted to head back down. There. Uh, but that would have been awesome because I love oysters and you love oysters. We could we could do that. My so mom got me some. started on oysters, as she likes to say, when I was three. Yes, you guys went to New Orleans and you ate. I ate all her oysters. You ate all her oysters, like a dozen oysters. Yeah. So I, I, my my history with oysters goes way back. So uh, let's see, we got tuna poke, which is was ahi tuna, soy ginger sauce, tobiko, which is the little uh, fish eggs, fish eggs, wakame, which I don't know that that was what I guess it was wakame in it, but also had seaweed salad on top. Yeah, the Japanese seaweed salad. And uh, wonton chips. And then the, another plate we got was the, the lomi lomi, which is cured salmon, avocado, cucumbers, and sesame oil. The tuna poke was good. It was really good. It was really good. The lomi lomi wasn't as good. The lomi lomi. It was a little salty. It was a little on the salty side, and it was kind of felt like it was missing some of the brightness. Yeah. Um, it was okay, but it wasn't, it wasn't stellar. One downside with the tuna poke, by the way, is there were definitely... Um, uh, scales, fish scales in it. I found a couple. You found one. Yeah, that, that's a that's that's a little careless for the for the price you're paying for things. It, they need to, to do a better job on that. And then you got a, a roasted beet salad, a roasted beet salad with goat cheese and arugula. It was really excellent. The Is it beets, pistachios too. It said pistachios on the menu, but I don't remember seeing any pistachios in my salad. So I think they shortchanged me on the pistachios mm. now that I think about it. I thought there was something that was missing. Yeah. Yeah, there weren't pistachios on it. It was good. It was really, really good. I I love a good beet salad, and mm -hmm. this was an especially nicely done one. The vinaigrette was perfect. And then we also got smoked trout deviled eggs. Those were good. Those were really good. I'm, I'm totally now want to find some smoked trout next time I make deviled eggs and try this because it was, yeah, the, it's, it's such an interesting, like that smoke flavor because there was plenty of smokiness in it. And that really went well with the eggs. Smoke and eggs is, mm. and then for drinks, you got, uh, what was the drink you got? It was, it was, it was we both got margaritas. It was something peachy. Oh, no, like, wait. I got a margarita. You didn't. No. Mine had Maker's Mark <laughs> and peach something or other and and some lemon. I don't remember all the... Peach ingredients. liqueur and something else. It was yummy. <laughs> Do you it was to, I remember it was the name. Peachy. Do you want me to tell the name? Sure. Get off your peach and get to work. <laughs> okay. That was a weird name. It My, was weird. Mine was a it caliente was margarita, which was basically very spicy margarita. It was, it was good. It was really spicy. Oh, you know what I wanted was the octopus. 
I don't know if it was on the menu. There was no octopus on the menu there. No, I kind of wanted I, octopus. I tried to order the ceviche. That's what I really wanted. Yeah. And sadly, they were out of ceviche. So. Mm. Yeah. I was a little sad. Yeah, it was it was OK. This place, the the location was really nice. I'm not sure I would like it was right next to Wahlburgers. I'm not sure it's like I, I definitely want to go back. I, I don't know that I, I would. Mm -hmm. If we were going out again, I might try something else. Some other place. Yeah, it was all sure. right. Um, it was kind of hit or miss. Like, like the, the, the poke bowl was really, really good. That was really good. Um, but everything else was sort of. Okay. Okay. I mean, the oysters were really good, but what do you, you're not going to screw up oysters. Yeah. It's kind of hard <laughs> to screw up oysters. They were really good. So, uh, then we walked around down, to, down by the marina to the sunset and, uh, it was watch, nice. Watch the boats. Watch the boats in. coming in and people with a lot more money than we do <laughs> taking care of the boats. These were some expensive boats and. And honestly, taking a boat out, like filling the filling the van for a hundred bucks is a lot. Like taking a boat out right for now is got to be a couple hundred dollars, like for the day. I mean, it's crazy. But um, brought me back to when my sister had a boat down in that same area. I don't know, it was I don't think it was the same marina, but uh, down near there, and uh, spending nights sitting on the boat under the stars. You know, after a day out on the water, listening to Kenny G. <laughs> Playing some Kenny G. Playing some cool jazz. Oh yeah, it takes me back. Whenever I wow. hear, whenever I hear, it was it? Is it Songbird? Whatever his song is, uh, it's the it's the one it's the mo the one he got famous for. Uh, always takes me back to sitting on the boat with Francesca. I guess that explains the Kenny G fascination. Yes, it is. A, it's just pure nostalgia. It's nostalgia connected to being on the water. So yeah, it's very very nineties. Yeah. <laughs> So that's what we've been doing. That's been a lot. It's been a week. It's been totally a week. All right. So let's talk about some food stuff. Uh, as you can tell, we've been out a lot. <laughs> and then right. the nights we've been in, we've been making some, some of our standards. We made, uh, we had uh, shrimp tacos the other day, which were, which were good, but we've talked about those and we made bourbon chicken. Which Actually, is another with the one. shrimp tacos though, I tried something new. Yes. I was going to mention that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So go ahead. And, and, and okay. So with, with the shrimp tacos, uh, I found a recipe online because I'm always looking for like new ideas to spice them up. And I found a recipe for the had uh, for fish tacos that had a um, uh, red onion pickle, red onion pickle and a slaw. And you use so basically you slice red onions and jalapenos thinly and you pickle them in uh, vinegar, sugar and salt just a really quick, easy pickle. But then you take some of the pickle brine and you use that as the flavoring for your coleslaw that's going to go on your... So it has that... The, the slaw had that lovely oniony, jalapeno-y flavor without chunks of jalapeno in it. Hmm. Um, I liked the pickled onions so well that I saved the brine and added more pickles and more onions and more jalapenos, and I ate those on my salad the next day. Right, you even put it on your in your uh, bourbon chicken or something, didn't you? I did. I put it on top of the bourbon chicken. I I could eat the pickled onions for every meal. I love them. Mm. Which, they're they're really good. Yeah, I would have I would have been totally anti pickled onions as a kid. I still think that sounds kind of weird, but so basically, good. basically, it's you take a, a red onion. Um, have it and then slice it thin. You want it very thin, uh, half rounds. Okay. Then two jalapeno chilies, you stem it, you take the stem off and then slice that into thin rings. I, I did it as thin as I could possibly slice it. They yep. were very thin slices. Then you take a cup of white wine vinegar, two tablespoons of lime juice, a tablespoon of sugar and a teaspoon of salt. Oh yeah. The lime juice. That's what I forgot. It, the lime added such a nice flavor note mm -hmm. to just it was so it wasn't just a vinegar pickle yeah it was um very good and uh so you take you take those you combine the onions and the jalapeno the vinegar you bring the vinegar lime juice sugar and salt to a bo boil in a small saucepan I, I skipped that step okay you could skip it i suppose i just i didn't even cook them i just threw them into a bowl, stirred them up, and poured them on top of my. I think if you heat it up, it'll it'll make it quicker. Maybe I don't know, but then you pour it over the onion mixture and let it sit for at least thirty minutes. Yeah, I I just I just poured it over. <laughs> okay, 
So this was part of a fish taco recipe. Right. So did you do the, you, but you did the cabbage part, but you didn't do the white sauce or the fish. Actually, I did the white sauce. Oh, you did? That was the white sauce we had? Yeah. Okay. So the cabbage is three cups of shredded green cabbage, a quarter pick, a quarter cup of the pickling liquid from the pickled onions, a half a teaspoon of salt and a half a teaspoon of pepper. Combine that all in a bowl and, and let that kind of soak in. Right. And then the, the white sauce is a half a cup of mayo, half a cup of sour cream, two tablespoons of lime juice, and two tablespoons of milk. And I skipped the milk. Okay, interesting. You, I suppose the milk just makes it a little less thinner. Thick. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I didn't feel a need for... Or thinner, which I is did, the word I was looking for. I, I did not feel a need to thin it out at all, so I okay. just did it that... I also added just the tiniest pinch of sugar to it. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I yeah. might have added more lime than the recipe called Cause, for. Yeah, because with all that lime and sour cream... And the mayo, it probably would tend to be a, a sourer, so a little bit of sugar. Just just not not very much. Just a pinch. Reached in my fingers and, and well, pinched out some. That's probably sugar. what the milk is doing in that recipe. Oh, probably. Probably the milk sugar is is c- cutting some of that that uh, sharpness. Anyway, I I just did my own thing. Yeah. So anyway, if uh, a rec, so recommend the pickled onions. Those were really good. It was really good. One thing I want to mention was, uh, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but keeping fresh veggies in the fridge is really hard for, you know, they, some veggies just go and farmer's market radishes or radishes I pull out of my own garden, they tend to go really quick. And so the, here's a tip for keeping fresh radishes. When you get them home, immediately, as quickly as you can, take some scissors and cut the top off. The, the, if, there's, if it's got greens, cut the greens off as close to the radish as you can. Even if you have to take a bit of the, the top of the radish, right. get all the green off. And then snip the, the root, that, the bottom root part. Okay, and so do that for all the radishes. Then take the radish and get, like, if you have a vegetable brush, you should have a vegetable brush. Uh, under running water, scrub the, both the cut places. Scrub the top and scrub the bottom. I scrub the sides too. You can scrub the sides too, but I scrub the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, th- then you take a, I take a zip baggie, like a quart, a quarter, a quart size zip lock bag. I put a piece of paper towel in the bottom to kind of make a pocket and, uh, and put all of the radishes in there. And then I don't close it all the way, but I close it part way. I, I don't want them to fall over the fridge in the uh, vegetable drawer, but, uh, but you don't want to close it because that would be, the scrubbing part is the important part. Yes. I, I've tried it lots. I've tried it without the scrubbing and just putting them in and just washing them. Scrubbing under cold water. Something about that. I don't know what the science is. Keeps, keeps them crisp. Yeah. It's, it's getting it's like, something off of it that, that, that's it's like magic. Yeah. Whatever you're taking off of it is the stuff that makes it start to break down and get soft. So totally. Yeah. Uh, that works for other sort of uh, root veggies like turnips and that sort of stuff too. Get the greens off right away. The gre- getting the greens off is important. Save the greens because they make, if you saute them, <laughs> say with some onion and uh, even bacon. Red pepper flakes. Red pepper flakes. They make a very nice dish. Yeah, radish greens. With a little cider vinegar. Radish greens are really good when they're cooked. Yeah. They're kind of bitter. I well, like to mix them with other If you've got baby spinach. Greens. That would be a good mix. Yeah. And and lots of onion because the onion helps to add some sweetness. Yes. Yep. So just a couple quick tips. Let's talk about things we've been reading and watching. Uh, I have yeah. finished not one, but two books this week. Wow. Yes. Well, <laughs> one was a short story. So <laughs> uh, the first one was the last book of the Expanse series. The Expanse, you may know it as the this multi, this 14 book series series of the near of near future science fiction about colonizing the solar system. Uh, or you may know it from the Amazon prime TV, uh, show. TV show. Uh, so I don't know if it was 14 books, but it's a lot of books. This was the last book called Leviathan falls. It was felt a little tedious, honestly, it, it, it felt like maybe the series should have ended a couple books ago. But they needed the problem was they had opened up this can of worms, this 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 thread. They unspooled this thread that needed to be, you know, f- finished. It, it, they needed to follow it to its. I, I lost my metaphor. They needed to follow to its this 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 plot thread to its logical conclusion, or it would just feel unfinished. They needed to 
close it off. And so they do it in this book, but it feels like you could have done it and you could have told this story quicker, but there wasn't, there wasn't any other story to tell. So we dragged it out. So it felt a little bit dragged out to, to, to get to where we were going. Um, it wasn't, it, it wasn't as entertaining as the previous books in the series. Honestly, if I were to read this, recommend the series, I'd, I'd almost say like read the first, I'd have to look at exactly at the books, like the first six books. I'd read like those totally would recommend those and only read the later ones uh, as a completionist sort of thing. Um, but that, that always bothers me because I do tend to try to be a completionist with things. Mm-hmm. But when a, when a series gets kind of worse and worse and worse gradually, I get frustrated because I want to be a completionist, but I'm. But, but you're not enjoying it as much as. But I'm not enjoying it. And I just I get mad at the author. <laughs> right. I mean, other people's mileage may vary. Other people may may really enjoy those later books. I I felt like like the last three especially just felt drawn out and was they, they didn't feel the same. It's the same thing with the Sterling Change series. Oh, yeah. I gave up on that. Yeah. You gave up a lot sooner than I did. But yeah, it was really good. The first three were excellent. The next three were were good. And then after that, it just was dragging it out and wasn't as good. So that I read that one. And then the uh, other thing, the short story I read was part of the Galactic Cold War series by Dan Morin, which I've been reading, really enjoying. Dan Morin's a podcaster who is he's like a Mac tech podcaster who became a novelist. And he's been writing these novels of the Galactic Cold War, which you have these. It's basically spies, James Bond, but in the future. Uh, and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy them. I like his his writing style. He's got a lot of humor. And uh, this was a short story. Um, not particularly fantastic, but if you've been reading the other books, you'll enjoy this. And it kind of fills out some of the story of one of the characters. Um, it was a dollar ninety nine on uh, on Amazon. So why not? It was it was good. I I I buy. I read all of them. You know. I really do have to say I like the model of self-publishing on Amazon where you can buy just a story because I remember in my younger days, yep. you would you would find an anthology that would have one story by one author and you'd have to buy the entire anthology just to read that story. Right. Either that or you'd have to like sit down in the book corner of the bookstore and read the story there. But no, I usually bought the anthology and then didn't really like the rest of it. Yes. I, I do like this model where authors who write, who have a series of books will, will in between the bigger books, the longer books put out short stories on their own that you can buy as eBooks for a, for a dollar or $2. And just to keep you, you know, keep interest, keep you in the loop of the, so you don't forget all about the series while you're waiting for the next book to but come. But also out. sometimes, I mean, some authors, they use that for opportunities to tell the side stories that wouldn't fit into the main plot. Right. And I like, I kind of like that. The little bits and pieces of that kind of make the universe feel more rounded. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree that that too. So uh, that's what I've been reading. You're still working on your books that we talked about at the top of the show, Brisbane and. Uh, and I'm also working th my way through Prisoners of Geography by Tim Marshall. Right. Which you've read before. No. Oh, you haven't. Oh, the Isabella read it. Isabella. For, that's for what school. we talked Yeah. Um, but I'm reading it for the first time. It's It's interesting. I feel like he pushes the geography as destiny a little bit too hard. Right. So the book, the book is the book's thesis is that geography has determined much of our history. C countries do countries and their people do things based because of where they're located and what's what they have. Right. All sorts of different things, whether it be natural resources, natural boundaries, natural barriers, right. lack of natural barriers, uh, all sorts of different geographical things which have shaped the way people like it doesn't really matter in some to some extent who's in charge because of these geographical issues these things are going to keep popping up over and over and over again which is true on the other hand leaders still do have free will and choice and they're not like he almost has a sort of calvinist idea 
of geography as predestination, mm-hmm. which I think he pushes it too far. The, especially when we got to the, the, the first chapters on Russia and he, he kind of argues and this, this book came out 2016 yeah. or earlier. Yeah. Some, t- some time ago, but he, he kind of says P- Putin didn't have a choice, but t- to invade Ukraine. And I'm like, well, you've always got a choice. He, he didn't, he didn't fill in the other parts of the proposition. If Russia wants to continue to X, Y, and Z, then you don't have a choice, but that's not the only possible way of thinking about things. Right. Um, so I like it in, in terms of like, really good thinking geographically thinking about why things are the way they are how geography shapes history really good just i i'm kind of reading with a little bit of a grain of salt because i i think he uh, overstates some things okay um so yeah so that's um prisoner of geography yeah. Right. So, and you're still working through that. So, I need to make a note of that, by the way, uh, so that I keep notes of what we've talked about, so that in the future, when I forget what we've talked about, <laughs> I can say we've already talked about that. Anyway, so uh, let's talk about things we've been watching, uh, which I have watched this week for a discussion that will be coming out again, like I, like last week. Uh, Secrets of movies and TV shows. We'll be doing an episode on A Man for All Seasons, the 1966 version starring Paul Schofield about St. Thomas More. Which I still haven't seen. Oh, you should definitely watch it. So a really, really excellent uh, story. Uh, one of the things I noted about it was it's it. He is in it. He is a very pious man and his faith does come out. But you don't see the saint, per se. It's not super pious. There's not a lot of his faith that's in it. It's, there's a lot more about him as a man of integrity, a man of law, a man of strong belief, uh, that sort of thing, man of strength. Uh, all of that comes through very clearly. And man of faith, to be sure, but it is not as much of it as you might think for like why this man is a saint. So... I feel like that's kind of true of most things I've read about St. Thomas More. That he wasn't, that he didn't seem to be a more conventional saint in the sense of his, although I've read stuff by Thomas More that was very faith filled, very, very much about right. faith. I think a lot of people have a hard time with the fact that he was a politician and lawyer and man of the world, and they don't quite know how to square that with sanctity. And that his martyrdom was about about his position, his political position. Right. I mean, but it was, but it was a... Because he defended the, the, the office of the Pope. Right. The authority of the Pope. Um, so other people, in it, oh, Robert Shaw, who was in Jaws as Quint, is a wonderful King Henry VIII. Manic, kind of a little bit crazy, like very much like Quint, actually, in some ways. Uh, but also... Not even in the movie a lot, it's, which is interesting. A lot of the antagonism comes from other characters like Cromwell and Richard Rich and some of the other figures from that era. Well, I mean, I think that's actually well, that's pretty, true. pretty historical. Right. Like, Henry didn't per- sort of personally have problems with war. It was more like a... He created the conditions for the problem. Yeah, right. But, but he, he liked... Henry war. was a bad king. <laughs> so he, he was. Yeah. Um, Vanessa Redgrave was in Berlin, but had hardly anything like she was, this was an early role for her. I think she didn't hardly do anything in this movie. She was in for like 30 seconds. Uh, so, uh, just kind of interesting, but, but it's one of those movies that I'd, I had never seen that everyone always says, you haven't seen that, uh, which is like Babette's feast. I've never seen it. Oh, now that I have seen it. it was, <laughs> that was a good movie. Or when we first started dating, I had never seen The Godfather. Well, Casablanca. That I could not believe you had not seen <laughs> Casablanca. Like, how how can you miss Casablanca? I only first saw The Godfather when we talked about it for movies and TV shows, the secrets of movies and TV shows like three years ago, two years ago. Like I had never seen that either. Like people don't believe that I've never seen, never seen him. Like it's like watching a family movie, which it was actually. It was a lot of 
like the the whole wedding scene in the godfather was like one of my family weddings from when i was a kid yeah but yeah it's i've had these really bad gaps in my movie watching which i'm making up for now but uh the godfather i mean obviously an awesome movie i seem to remember when we were first actually dating not even married going through your netflix like queue you know back when you like set up a queue you had dvds of, like, yeah the netflix mailed you dvds and you, you sort of set up a list of what you wanted to eventually watch via netflix and i remember like a whole bunch of the I can't believe you haven't seen these ended up on that list. <laughs> right. I'm sure the list is long gone. But. The list. Well, I I think I saved it at one point and it's, so it's probably somewhere in Evernote. Um, but yeah, that was, a, that was very much a thing of it's of a very defined period of time. The, when you're dating someone, what's on their Netflix queue. I'm sure that was a thing like for a while. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> That dates us. That definitely. that definitely dates us within a very specific period of time because that wasn't that long that that was a thing. It was very much a thing. Like Netflix, Netflix DVDs was was a huge thing for a short period of time. Right. All right. So Watchmen for all seasons. I also watched the first couple episodes of the third season of The Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch. This is a History Channel show about this very strange place called Skinwalker Ranch. Jimmy Aiken and I talked about it on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in one of our most popular episodes ever, number 35. You can find that at mysterious.fm slash 35 if you, if you haven't seen, uh, listened to that yet. Uh, it's, it's an incredible place and thing. Weird, really weird stuff goes on there. So this, t- this TV series has been following it. And I, I have to say... I really wish it it would be a better show if it were less reality TV and more documentary. They do a lot of this reality TV, like hyping up the drama and, you know, repeating things and, oh, and people are like, oh, this thing and blah. And it's like, if you just, if you did it straight, this is, you report it more journalistic, it would be just as fascinating and pra- practically perhaps even more fascinating because it would be less frustrating uh, to watch. I mean, they were there. They, uh, they do have weird things going on, but sometimes they do this reality TV thing so much. It makes me wonder, are they faking it? Like, is this, is this particular thing being faked, which is frustrating because based on the stuff that Jimmy and I talked about, there's something going on there, but I feel like the way that they're doing this show is obscuring that 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 search for whatever that is so anyway um it might be connected to and in fact in the show they can they are explicitly connecting it to the famous tic tac incidents off of the coast of san diego in 2004 when the u.s navy's fighter jets encountered tic tac shaped flying unidentified aerial phenomena as they call them now uh or ufos uh back back then they're they're specifically connecting them. And in fact, the U S government has connected those two because they've sent the same guys who were in charge of investigating the 2004 thing. They sent them to Skinwalker ranch to do investigations. Interesting. Yeah. So something going on there. Uh, so you've been watching something new. Uh, I wouldn't say been watching. I watched one episode. You of- watched one episode of something new. <laughs> I watched the first episode of the father Brown TV show on Brett Brit box. Um, the newish one, I guess. 2013 was the first season. So, so newish, not super new. Yep. Um, it was good. Uh, several of my friends had been talking about it uh, online, and some who surprised me as I didn't think would be the target audience who were kind of raving about it. So, I figured it was worth giving it a shot. Okay. So, started in 2013, but still going. So, obviously, something good. Uh, and so today we've in our family um, marched through the Mar- the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We've come to Falcon and Winter Soldier. I really like Falcon and Winter yes. Soldier. And we've watched the first episode. We again, you and I have watched it the whole series before, but this is the kids' first time through. And we both were commenting on as in this how much we liked the scenes of uh Winter Soldier of uh, Bucky Barnes in therapy. Bucky in therapy is awesome. I, I was thinking, like, after we'd finished watching it, he is a member of the greatest generation. 
they do not do therapy. Like this is the generation. Right. That they, they would have just about, gained therapy. We don't, we don't talk about feelings. We don't talk about therapy, but what's, what's disconcerting is that he looks very young and this is a very modern therapist. And so there's this disconnect that this show doesn't actually address directly. It's just kind of funny when you start to think about like how old he is, what his, how he's formed by his particular circumstances growing up and the war that he fought in and how he really is that fish out of water. Hmm. But then I also really like uh, Sam Wilson's relationship with his sister. So yep. good. I just, it's got that great sibling. It feels true to the sibling. To the sibling, the nature of the sibling relationship. There's not a whole lot of really good, strong brother, sister relationships in movies, I don't think. Um, Certainly in the MCU, are there other brother, sister? I mean, well, there's Wanda and Pietro, but Pietro gets killed off really quickly. Yeah, that's true. Um, so there's there's more there, for there. It's more of a the loss of that sibling. And well, there's also Black Panther. You have um, T'Challa and his sister. What's her name? Who he he dies. So yeah, and th their their relationship is there's there's some nice little back and forth moments. But there's not a lot to it. Right. It's it's kind of incidental chit chat. She she kind of plays the role in, of M in the James Bond movies. Like the the one who comes up with the cool devices. Q is the Q. Yes. Q. M is the boss. Q is the Right, Q. Yep. So she's kind of the Q character. Like she she's the one who does all the cool tech things. Right. Um but Sam and his sister have a semi adversarial relationship. In that they can't agree on a very important thing, but they love each other deeply. And the squabble about it is the squabble of two siblings who love each other, who don't want to disagree, but they can't come to an agreement. And that feels so true. It's not manufactured drama. It's he was gone mm -hmm. and she had to deal with stuff. And now he comes back as the brother who wants to swoop in and save things. <laughs> literally. Literally. And she she sees right through him and she's she's like, you don't understand. You weren't here. I've had to make hard decisions. You can't just come in and try to countermand my decisions. You left town. You left the family when you joined the Air Force when you were 18. And you've been gone for a lot of that time since then. And then, of course, he was literally gone during the blip. Yeah. Um, and I just I feel like that relationship just feels very true. Mm. And I like I I like it. In the future episodes, we will see then the Bucky and Sam relationship grow. But in the first episode, we're just cutting back and forth between them. We don't see. Um, They're not together. We don't see them together yet. Right. The other thing I like about Bucky is this making amends thing and this. Yes. The Mr. Nakamura Nakami, Nakamiya Nakamura. No, it's Nakajima. 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 Yeah. It could. The, the Bucky making amends could be really cheesy, and yet they manage to make it not. Yeah. They really bring out the pathos of what he did as the Winter Soldier and how it's broken him and how hard it is to come back from that. And, and the fact is he's trying to make amends with a man who is sure to hate him for what he's done. But who is his friend now? His, his really his only friend. And so when he tells him what he's done, his friend, he's going to lose his friend. Right. And so he's got two, two directives from his therapist. Make amends and make friends. And these directives are at war in this particular case. Right. And, and the, he's a very conflicted person. I mean, he's, he's so tormented and so wounded. And yet you really want to like him. Right. I mean, partly you, you initially like Bucky because for Steve's sake, I think. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how they take a character who is, seems so absolutely evil in Winter Soldier. Just lost, completely lost to the dark side, basically. Right. Um, in fact, kind of like Kylo Ren. Yeah, but but I think that Bucky's... Bucky's a more successful character. A much though. more successful character. Kylo Ren... Apart could, from the cool mask. Could have been 
a really interesting rehabilitation. It, but those it, movies it, went they, off the rails. They kind of flubbed it in the last couple of movies. Right. And of course, Darth Vader gets his rehabilitation only is, in it's death. A, it's the deathbed conversion. Con- yeah, spoilers. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Spoilers for A New Hope. Seriously, that movie came out <laughs> no, when no, I was. That was Return of the Jedi, but that oh. was, but yes, a 40 year old movie. Yeah. Just, that I'm just kidding. Soul yeah. So, um, speaking of spoilers, I did have a question watching this. Okay. And I'll, I'll say it in a way that hopefully won't be a spoiler. Where is Steve? Where is Steve at this point? Right. In the story, he's sort of not there. And, and they're talking about him in the past tense. Yeah. So, where do you, so. But there's no real explanation. There's no real explanation there. And when we last saw him, it didn't seem like he should be going anywhere permanently. So I, <laughs> probably, it's probably that's probably totally spoiled. Honestly, I really kind of like the, the theory that's brought up. <laughs> Steve's in a ba- secret base on the moon. I want Steve to be on a secret base on the moon. How long right. does the super soldier live? That's that's a that's the question. How long does a super soldier live? You know, Wolverine is essentially immortal, I think. I think that MCU has established or Marvel has established, not MCU per se. Right. Mar- Marvel has established that Wolverine is essentially, Im- you know, could live forever. Uh, I'm trying to think of what they did in the movie Logan. Uh, they talked about they, that came up in that. I never saw Logan. Interesting movie. Not like a not like any other superhero movie you've ever seen. Right. So anyway. Uh, so that's what we've been watching and, uh, more winter soldier, Falcon and winter soldier to come. I don't know if we, if we do this one episode, of, like one hour, one episode a week, it's going to take forever to get through it. That's okay. Uh, okay. I mean, I want to get to other stuff besides MCU. I want to talk like other movies with the kids, but we'll get there. Um, okay. Let's talk about some Catholic things. I want to bring up the Nancy Pelosi, Archbishop Corte Leone. Communion thing. I really don't want to bring that up. Okay, okay. You, you don't have to, to comment on it, but I, I want to bring it for a very specific reason. There's so much of the commentary online, and thank God I don't have a I don't have to talk about it online. But I'm not I'm, I'm not really going to talk about it that specifically. Um, but so much of the commentary is about political points, taking sides. Uh, really, you know, the the take you have on it really has to do with your political opinion. In many cases, not everyone certainly. Uh, there are a lot of you know uh, good good-hearted, well-meaning people. But I noticed some people taking glee in Nancy Pelosi getting punished. And something occurred to me during, like after the uh, gospel, his father was starting his homily. And I don't know if it was inspiration or or just mind-wandering, but I had like a, a sort of parable come to mind. A man had three sons. The first son was disobedient and lived the a self-destructive life. Sounds like the parable of the prodigal son, right? Mm-hmm. But there are three sons. The father, in an attempt to save the son from co- his coming self-destruction, imposed a restriction on him and a punishment. Uh, you can't come home until you've stopped doing this thing. The second son said, finally, I wanted to see his come up and he'll be so mad. The third son said, thank God. Maybe this will save my brother. Which of the second and third brothers showed his love for the first brother? The third brother. When we see a bishop imposing a discipline upon anyone, anyone, doesn't have to be a politician, but anyone, or a, or a spiritual father imposing a discipline on any spiritual child, it shouldn't be, yes, they're getting it. Shouldn't be schadenfreude. Our reaction should be, thank God, maybe this will save my brother or sister. So just wanted to throw that out there. All right. So the the gospel for this week uh, and the readings uh, are about authority in the church and the Holy Spirit, coming of the Holy Spirit. The first reading is from the Acts of the Apostles, and it tells the story of uh, the... Council of Jerusalem, basically. Yes, the Council of Jerusalem and the the uh, the church in Antioch, uh, Syria and Cilicia, and you had these Christians show up, these these missionaries show up, and telling everyone, look, if you want to be a Christian, you first have to become a Jew, and that means circumcision. And a lot of people 
<laughs> understandably said, I don't want to be circumcised. <laughs> that doesn't seem like fun to me. I would rather become a Christian without going through that. Is that not possible? And some people said, well, yes, you don't and have also, to be. Paul and Barnabas had already been preaching that you did not need to be circumcised. So Paul and Barnabas had come in, converted a bunch of people, said you don't need to be circumcised. And now here come these uh, other missionaries saying you're not real. You're not real Catholics because you haven't abided by these rules that we say you have to. Right. That sounds a little familiar, frankly, which, which the Council of Jerusalem made it very clear in their letter those people did not have authority from us to say that. Well, and until this point, the question is who had authority in the church? Like, right. really, there was there, this was still an open question. Who has authority? Now, Jesus gave Peter, first as, as, as in his primacy, but also the apostles, authority. But this was still an open question. Until they asserted that authority, it was an open question. So this was the opportunity for them to assert their authority and say, yeah, they don't have they don't have the authority to say that we are we have this authority given to us by Jesus. And so we will assert that they don't have the authority to say that. Uh, so um, they sent Judas and Silas. And Barnabas and Paul back to Antioch to tell them, look, here's here's it is the decision of the Holy Spirit and of us not to place on you any burden beyond these necessities. Abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meats of strangled animals, and from unlawful marriage. Don't do any of that. You're doing what's right. That's the uh, the first uh, dubium <laughs> response. Uh, but it, it's really Father had uh, Father Leo was the 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 uh, the celebrant today, and he said there's a he said a couple things. First, these are these are about the authority of Peter and the apostles in the church. It's the debate over circumcision was about a clear separation between the Old Testament and, and the New. The Old Testament is closed. The New Testament is here. So there's this separation. And one of the things he said was, we should be more attached to Christ than to our own opinions. The apostles turned to the Holy Spirit for clarity, for understanding, not to their own opinions. They prayed and they were led by the Holy Spirit. So uh, I really, I felt like that's, <laughs> this weekend especially, it felt appropriate to, to be the reading for this week um, as we're heading toward Ascension Thursday and Pentecost right afterward. So, um, yeah, any thoughts? Yeah, I, he, he talked about how we don't really pay enough attention to the Holy Spirit, and that feels really true to me. Jesus... He's the son. He's the incarnate word. God, the father is, is the father. We, we know what a son is and we know what a father is. And we know Jesus through his incarnation. And we know God, the father through his revelation, but the Holy spirit is the person of the Trinity who feels at least like a person. Right. Because, because He's not incarnate. And what's a spirit? What, what, who is the Holy spirit? He is feels, it a bird floating above us? Right. He feels mysterious and kind of hard to get to know. And I'm not sure that I know what else to do with that, but mm -hmm. but I I kind of like having it acknowledged at least that we're still kind of Well, as some people have pointed out, you know, it's we're we're still in history. The doctrine is still unfolding and developing in our understanding of the doctrine. I mean, the the deposit of the faith is is what it is, but we delve deeper into it over time. And it could be a thousand more years before we have a real unfolding of what the whole, of the theology of the Holy spirit for us, you know, for the church. I mean, we're, <laughs> we'll be hopefully be in the presence of the Holy spirit by then. But uh, so it is hard because we understand what a father is. We, we, we've all had fathers or we've seen fathers. We have examples of fathers and we know you know, that Jesus was a man and we understand that real physical presence, but what is the spirit? What is the Holy spirit? And what is that? What does the Holy spirit bring to the table? Yeah. It is hard to, to kind of come. That's why the Holy spirit is often kind of overlooked, overlooked and left to the side. I mean, not everyone does. Certainly the charismatic renewal has really Pentecostalists in, in general have turned toward the Holy spirit and really 
made the, the, the works of the Holy Spirit very present and the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, very present in their faith, life, and devotion. So, uh, yeah, which, by the way, uh, Father had, a, at the end of Mass, we had our uh, announcements, and at the end of the announcements, which included, you know, uh, the Feast of the Ascension of Thursday, Mass times were in the bulletin, he kind of got up, and he's not a, he's not assigned to our parish. He is a Holy Cross Father at the nearby uh, college. So he helps out on the weekends, and he kind of criticized a little bit. Did you notice? No, not, not just not a just little even bit. a little bit. He was like, pretty strong. It's you know we need to be saying the whole feast of the ascension in 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 Boston. By the way, if we celebrate the feast of the ascension on Thursday as a holy day, not it, we don't move it to Sunday. But he says the feast of the ascension is a holy day of obligation. We and we shouldn't be just saying go look in the bulletin for the mass times. We should be telling people what the mass times are so that you can go. Yeah, I I spent several minutes looking through the bulletin trying to find the mass times and they were not easy to spot they were in a text box among a lot of other things on the jumble on the page there was did not visually stand out at all and it was on the third page of the bulletin and when i was doing the, the parish bulletin important information went on the front page at the top you know or you're somewhere very visible very large in because that's the sort of thing people need to see not pretty pictures we're not selling anything by you know we're not trying to sell the the bulletin by having a pretty picture you need to have important information right up front so in any case the uh he he had that to say also you had something to comment about new hymns did you want to say anything about that like when they introduced new hymns not at mass? hymns Sung prayers. Sung prayers, right. New ver- new settings for the sung prayers. Yeah. Our, our choir recently changed the Gloria that they've been using for years to a new setting. But in other parishes, when, when the choir has changed the setting of a prayer, they introduce it before mass. They have the, the congregation sing it through a few times. So we all know what we're on the same page. We know what's up. We know what we're singing. And none of that has happened. Mm. And it's really disorienting because I want to sing along and I do not know this tune. I mean, I know the the words of the Gloria, but I do not know the tune at all. And it's really frustrating. Yeah. So yeah. if you're if you're involved in choir, make sure that if you're changing the I mean, hymns are one thing like everyone can like kind of figure out a hymn. But a prayer is a prayer. It kind of betrays something about the uh, an attitude, and I, I don't want to criticize our music ministry that much. I mean, because they do a great job in general, and uh, it's hard work. But if if you if it it kind of shows that it in some sense, in some mindset, it's this is a performance and not leading people in prayer. We need to make sure that we're always leading people in prayer and not just performing the music, the prayer. So just a thought, you know, anyway. So with that, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Bets, including Martin O, Kevin F, Del M, Victoria M, and Rex K. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Raising the Bets and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. You'll find links from our discussion in our show notes at sqpn.com slash bets. You can send your feedback at the SQPN Facebook page, facebook.com slash starquestmedia. Send an email to bets, B-E-T-T-S, at sqpn.com. Or like we said earlier, visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. Until next time, I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. <laughs>